All right, it's time to get into the meat of nuclear physics. So this is where we have the more intensive math bit. And I want to come back to this graph that we looked at a little bit earlier. So this is showing our binding energy as a function of the atomic mass number. Now, the goal at every time is to try and get as high up on the y-axis as possible. So depending where you're at, there are different ways to achieve that. So for example, when we're really far over on this curve, the best way to get higher is to make the element is to split into smaller pieces or to go from heavier to lighter elements. Whereas over here on the left side, if I'd like to get further up the curve, the best way to achieve that is to start to merge together. So if we start to combine together, we get to heavier elements and we move our way up this y-axis. So over in this region where in order to achieve greater stability, we want to split things apart. This is where we're dealing with fission. So in nuclear fission, we are taking heavy elements and we are splitting them apart. And then by splitting them, we're able to get some energy from that. Now, when we have two low mass nuclei, they will achieve greater stability by fusing them together. This is what we refer to as nuclear fusion. So that we get energy by fusing those two light nuclei together, we also get energy from that. And the way to calculate that energy is using Einstein's mass energy equivalent. So we have that E equals delta mc squared. So this time for mass defect, how we're going to phrase this, because we're not looking at a nucleus this time, we're looking at an actual decay chain. The mass defect is going to be the mass of your reactants minus the mass of your products. So basically it's going to be the mass of everything on the left side of the decay equation minus everything on the right side of the equation. That will always hold true. And this works for fission, fusion, alpha decay, and beta negative decay. It's a little bit more complicated with beta positive decay, but we won't be doing beta positive decay for this stuff. So anytime you're using E equals MC squared, you are using physics principle number six, the last one we have to talk about in the course, which is conservation of mass energy. So let's look at how this works. So as we mentioned, in nuclear fission, what we are doing is we are taking a large nucleus and splitting it into smaller ones. More commonly how this is going to be done, like in a nuclear reactor, for example, we're going to have uranium-235, a very heavy element, and it's going to get bombarded by a neutron. And then that's going to turn it into uranium-236, which is highly unstable. So for this thing to achieve stability, it's going to split into lighter elements. In this case, barium-141 and krypton-92. What this splits into, it can be different. It's as long as we respect our conservation rules, we're good. And then this will produce three free neutrons that'll go on its way. So this is showing the typical fission, fission equation. With fission, we absolutely need to have neutrons as part of our product. So this must be there for fission. And it doesn't have to be three. You will see cases where there's two neutrons produced, but for fission, we have to have neutrons produced. This is why alpha decay is not considered fission. Now, in a nuclear reactor, what we would generally like to have happen is we'd like this decay to happen, but then we'd only let want one of these neutrons to cause another fission reaction. The other two, we'd like them to be absorbed. What this is known as is controlled fusion. That way we have one fission per, sorry, this is known as controlled fission. So we have one fission for every single reaction, nice and even. If However, we let all three of these produce another fission reaction, and then all three in each of those subsequent reactions produces a fission reaction. What we're going to have is uncontrolled fission. So that has consequences. For example, Chernobyl, that was uncontrolled fission. Nuclear bombs, that's uncontrolled fission. So uncontrolled fission is very dangerous. Our objective is generally to control that. So let's look at a fission example to find the energy. So we have a uranium-235 nucleus, it absorbs a neutron, and then it splits into bromine-87, lanthanum-146, and additional neutrons. We'd like to find the balanced equation and then determine the energy released in mega electron volts. So we're going to need the following information. All right, so we have uranium-235, and we're told it absorbs a single neutron. So for us in physics, a neutron is written as 10n. It has a nucleon number of one because a neutron is a nucleon, and there's one of them. It has zero charge, so we're going to put a zero there, and then we're going to put the N for neutron. Now, we are told that this decays into bromine-87. 
So we have 87. And then for bromine, we are looking at element 35, bromine, plus lanthanum 146. So lanthanum 146, we're going to go to the lanthanide section of the periodic table in the bottom. So lanthanum is element number 57. And then we have additional neutrons. What we'd like to find is we'd like to find how many of those we have. So what we have going on here is I have my 235U plus 10. All right. Now, let's look at the top. So I have 235 plus 1. So on the left, I have 236. And then on the right here, I have 87 plus 146, which gives 233. So I have 236 equals 233. The only way to balance this out is to have three more neutrons. Now, the mistake people want to make is they want to write something like this. I'm going to put it up here. They want to write 30N. This is not correct because the neutron is not written like this. We're still going to write the neutron like this, but to quantify that we have three of them, we're going to put a three out front. So it's going to look exactly like this because that three applies to both the A and the Z value. So 235 plus 1 is equal to 87 plus 146 plus 3 times 1. So conservation of nucleons is respected. And then 92 plus 0 is 92. 35 plus 57 plus 3 times 0 is also 92. So that's good. We have our conservation laws respected. So in this decay equation, we have our reactants on the left side, and we have our products on the right. In order to find the mass defect, what we are going to do is we're going to take the total mass of the reactants and we're going to subtract the total mass of the products. And that's the same no matter what type of reaction we're looking at. So the mass defect is going to be the mass of the reactants minus the mass of the products. So for the reactants, we have uranium-235, so we have 235.043930U. And then we also have a single neutron, so that 1.008665U. And from that, we are going to subtract the products. When you're subtracting the products, put brackets around the products because we want to subtract off the total product. So we want to make sure we put a bracket around this. So we have bromine 87, which is 86.920711U. And then we have lanthanum, which is our 145.925791U. And then we have three neutrons. So we have the 1.008665U. Now, the hard part with these questions is we have to be really careful. There are a lot of places to make mistakes. We have a lot of numbers that we have to punch in, so we're going to be really careful. So I'm doing this right now. I'm just trying to be really careful. I'm very slow and methodical with my punching the numbers in, just because I don't want to make a mistake here. And then 1.008665. All right, so if I do all that very carefully, what I'm getting is I'm getting a mass defect of 0.180098U. So when this reaction happens, there's a mass piece that is missing, and I use missing very loosely. It's not actually missing. This gets converted to energy. So this is converted to energy, and what we want to find is we want to find that energy that is released. Now to do that, we must convert this to kilograms because our equation does not work with u. So we have that 0 0.180098 and we are going to multiply that by 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilogram per u. So what we're going to get is we're going to get about 2.98963 times 10 to the minus 28 kilograms. So that is going to give us what we need here. Now, what we need to do is we need to put this into E equals mc squared. We now have the mass in kilograms, so let's go with that now. Right. So we have E equals mass defect times c squared. So we have that 2.98963 times 10 to the minus 28 kilograms. We're going to multiply that by 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared. And this is going to give us an energy of about 2.69066 
times 10 to the minus 11 joules. Now, for the most part, we'd be pretty happy with that, but we've actually been asked to find the energy released in mega electron volts. So we'd need to convert this into mega electron volts. Well, first of all, we know that in a single electron volt, we have 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And then we know that we also have a million electron volts for every mega electron volt. So the joules are going to cancel, electron volts are going to cancel. So what we're going to get for this, if we're really careful, we're going to get about 168.167 mega electron volts. So based on this fission reaction, this is the energy that's going to be released from that decay. We're going to get about 168.167 mega electron volts. The biggest mistake in all of these is not punching in the numbers correctly in the calculator. It's a very common mistake. I make it quite a bit too. We're all human, but just something to be aware of. So turning our attention now to fusion. Basically, fusion, there's a whole story here looking at what powers the sun and all that. And you can read all that. And this is just kind of showing the mechanism for what powers the sun. But basically, the gist of fusion, we are taking lighter nuclei, combining them together to make a heavier nucleus, and energy is going to be released in that process. The way to determine the energy is the exact same for fission. The mass defect is going to be the reactants minus the products. So let's look at this. We're going to take a part of the proton-proton chain in the sun. So in the sun, we're going to have two helium-3 nuclei. They are going to fuse together to produce helium-4 plus two protons or hydrogen nuclei plus a gamma particle. Now, we want to find, so first of all, we want to find the energy released by the photon along with its wavelength in the following reaction. So first of all, we need to find the energy released and then that energy released is going to be carried away by the photon. So this does not have any mass, so it will not contribute to our mass defect. So once again, left side, these are reactants. And then we're going to have our products here. I'm not too worried about the gamma photon, just because it will not contribute to the mass defect. So the mass defect is going to be our reactants minus our products. So on the right side, we have two helium-3 nuclei. So we're going to multiply 2 times 0, 3.016029 U. And then from that, we want to subtract off our product. So we have helium-4, which we have a mass of 4.002603U. And then we also have our two hydrogen nuclei. So we have our 1.007825U. So this deficit in mass, this is what's going to be converted into energy in this reaction. So I've entered that. And again, I've got to be really careful because there's so many places to make mistakes in this. 1.007825. So what I'm going to get for mass defect is I'm going to get 0.013805U. Now this is also going to tell me the significant digits because these leading zeros don't count. These five digits count here. So this has five significant digits. So my final answer is going to have five significant digits. This deficit in mass is what's converted into energy. So we still need this thing to be converted into kilograms. So we're going to multiply that by 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27. So we're going to get about 2.29163 times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms. And that is what we can use for the energy. So we have E equals MC squared. We have this 2.29163 times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms. We're going to multiply that by 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared. And this is going to give us the energy in joules. Now, we were not told that we had to find the energy in mega electron volts, so we're just going to leave this be. So we get 2.0625 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. So this has five significant digits. This is the energy released in the reaction. So that's the first part. We we're also asked to find the energy that was carried away by the photon, or sorry, the wavelength of the photon that carried away this energy. Again, we know that E is equal to HC over lambda, or lambda is just HC over E. 
So the wavelength of this photon, we're going to have that 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. We have our 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then we're going to divide that by that energy that we just calculated. So again, these two values here are constants. They don't count for significant digits. So we still want to have five significant digits for our answer because it's only going to be dictated by this energy here. So what we're going to get, we're going to get about 9.6438 times 10 to the minus 14 meters. So in this fusion reaction in the sun for this one decay chain happening once, it releases about 2.0625 times 10 to the minus 12 joules of energy. And then the photon that carries away that energy is going to have a wavelength of about 9.6438 times 10 to the minus 14 meters. This wavelength is in the gamma range, so we're pretty happy with that. Last thing, let's look at alpha and beta decay. So alpha and beta decay, the process is exactly the same. Mass defect is reactants minus products. So you can really autopilot this. So we want to find the energy released during the alpha decay of uranium-238. You will need the following nuclear masses. All right, so uranium-238 is going to decay by alpha decay. So if we remember that we have an alpha particle here, so 42 alpha, or you could also write this as 42 helium. It doesn't actually matter. There's no preference. I seem to write it like this a lot. Now, based on this alpha particle, that means by conservation of nucleons and charge, my daughter element is going to be thorium 234. So in this example here, I have a single reactant and I also have two products. So to find my mass defect, we're going to take the mass of the reactants minus the mass of the products. So we're going to take the mass of uranium-238, and we're going to subtract off the total mass of this alpha particle and thorium-234. So uranium-238, we have a mass of 238.050788U. And then we are going to subtract off the total mass of our alpha particle plus the thorium-234. So this is going to give us an energy or a mass defect of what? So again, lots of number crunching. We got to take it really slow and steady. So this is going to give us a mass defect of 0.004584U. So these leading zeros do not count. These four digits assess, or tell us the significant digits. So we're going to have four significant digits for our answer. Of course, we have to convert this to kilograms. This is not going to work for us. So we multiply that by 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27. So we're going to get that the mass defect is about 7.609 times 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. So the last step. E is mass defect C squared. So we're going to take that mass defect that we just calculated. We're going to multiply it by the speed of light squared. So what this is going to do with four significant digits, we're going to get an answer of 0 point, or 6.848 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So in this particular alpha, rea alpha decay, we're going to release about 6.848 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So the last one is our beta negative decay. And this one's a little bit more challenging and not really, but I'll explain in a moment. So we want to determine how much energy we'd expect for the beta negative decay of a thorium-234 nucleus. You'll need the following. All right, so thorium-234 is going to look a little bit like this. And now it's going to decay into the following. So we're going to have 234, and then we're going to have protactinium plus the beta particle plus the antineutrino. Now, we have our reactants and our products, but here's the deal. We don't give you the mass of the electron, nor do we give you the mass of the antineutrino. For physics 30 purposes, the masses of the uh, beta particle and the antineutrino, they're inconsequential. They're so much smaller 
than the masses of the protactinium and thorium that they're not really going to affect our mass defect. Now, if we're looking for absolute precision and we want like the best possible answer, yes, we'd include them. For the purposes of physics 30, we can ignore the mass of the alpha, par sorry, the beta particle and the antineutrino. So they're going to be inconsequential. So really, our reactant's going to be thorium-234. And then we have a single product, which is going to be protactinium-234. So the mass defect is going to be the mass of thorium-234. So we've got our 234.043601. And then we're going to subtract from that 234.043308U. So that is going to give us our mass defect. So it's going to tell us how much energy we're going to get from this beta decay. So we are going to get about 0.000293U. So this answer has three significant digits. So three significant digits is what we're going to expect at the end. Once again, we have to convert this into kilograms. Which is going to give us about 4.8638 times 10 to the minus 31 kilos. And then to calculate the energy released, we're going to do mass defect times c squared. So we've got that 4.8638 times 10 to the minus 31 kilos times speed of light squared. The last part here, we want three significant digits for our answer, so we're going to get it from 4.38 times 10 to the minus 14 joules. So for this beta decay, ignoring the masses of the beta particle and the antineutrino, we're going to get the energy release is about 4.38 times 10 to the minus 14 joules.